Have you ever heard of a man known as Og? References to Og appear in the Phoenician inscriptions from Byblos, within the much older Canaanite Ugaritic texts, within Midian on the northwest Arab Peninsula, in Deuteronomy, in the Book of Numbers, and in Joshua. Mentioned in many religious and non-religious texts, King of Basham, which is now the Golan Heights. Who was this Og? Well, it turns out, Og was a giant. A rather special giant. He was, in fact, the last of his kind. The Book of Numbers states that he died during the Battle of Edrai. Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 11 declares that his bedstead, translated in some texts as sarcophagus, was made of iron and was 9 cubits in length and 4 cubits in width, about 13 and a half feet by 6 feet. It goes on to say that at the royal city of the Ammonites, his giant bedstead could still be seen as a novelty at the time the texts were written. Fast forward to the present day, and a miraculous discovery has been made. A discovery which could see more biblical stories being proven historically accurate. A recent archaeological dig has unearthed no less than two dozen skeletons, all of giant proportions near the ancient ruins of Rujim el Herai, which is indeed located within the Golan Heights. What's more, compellingly, this was no normal burial. During a press briefing, the team responsible for the discovery expressed their views to the world. Quote, the site of Rujim el Herai has been extensively searched for decades already, but our team noticed a mound nearby, which we thought was of major interest. It has been two long years, but it was definitely worth the effort," said Tom Yagur, one of the archaeologists on site. One of the giants was covered in an exquisitely crafted suit of copper armor. One of their copper swords was also as hard as steel and made in a fashion unknown to modern man. Could this really be the final resting place of the last of the giants? All we can hope is that the Smithsonian doesn't get a chance to buy them. A little over a year ago, we shared the story surrounding a mysterious discovery that was once claimed to have been made deep within cave systems within Ecuador, which some believe were originally man-made. A discovery that, although now concealed from the world, was photographed, studied, and documented thanks to the array of artifacts which had been amassed by an individual known as Father Crespi. An entire, seemingly alien metallic library, complete with hundreds of sheets of gold, platinum, and other precious metals, hammered out to reveal an astonishing unknown language, clearly left by a people of tremendous capabilities. The caves in which this find is claimed to have been made is known as Cueva de los Teos. And although such discovery is denied by the Ecuadorian authorities, the Ecuadorian and, interestingly, United Kingdom's governments funded an extensive search of the cave systems soon after the claims became public. It attracted the attention of numerous individuals who traveled into the depths of these caves, including Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. What we wish to focus on this video, however, is the enormous, seemingly man-made caverns which are found to be within the cave systems. We feel, if these cave systems are indeed one day admitted, as having been artificially hewn from the bedrock, then this would undeniably reveal tremendous flaws in academia's claims as to the geology and indeed true history of the area. The cave system is so enormous, it has yet to be fully explored by modern man. Yet what has been explored has revealed highly compelling features, which corroborate earlier claims of an artificial origin. The Moritza portal, for example, named after Juan Moritza, the individual who claims to have originally discovered the metallic library, is clearly of an artificial nature. The question is, why go to such lengths to construct this natural-looking cave system? Was it all created merely to hide this library? And if so, how important could the information held within be? And why did such a find attract the attention of the first man on the moon? Did the astronaut know something we are yet to discover? Juan Moritza signed affidavit dated 8th of July 1969 
in which he confessed to a meeting with the Ecuadorian president, where he received complete control over his discovery, provided he could provide photographic evidence and an independent witness corroborating the discovery. When Moritza met with von Däniken in 1972, he took him to a secret entrance, through which they entered a large artificial hall within the cave system. Apparently, von Däniken never got to see the library itself. He wrote in his book, The Gold of the Gods, quote, The passages all form perfect right angles. Sometimes they are narrow, sometimes wide. The walls are smooth and often seem to be polished. The ceilings are flat and at times look as if they were covered with a kind of glaze. My doubts about the existence of the underground tunnels vanished as if by magic, and I felt tremendously happy. Moritza said passages like those extended for hundreds of miles under the soils of Ecuador and Peru." End quote. We feel the question now is, who went to these unimaginable efforts so far back within history? Why create such a place deep within the Earth with such an intended illusion of natural origin if you did not seek to hide something? Many still believe that the truth is still hidden deep inside its unexplored caverns, a truth that will force us to completely rewrite the history of mankind. Are the legends true surrounding Cuevo de los Teos? Did it once indeed contain an ancient metallic library, left to us by an ancient civilization? We find the evidence to suggest so highly compelling. We have in the past covered the fascinating legends and indeed recovered artifacts that have been found over the years within the Ecuadorian cave system, known locally as Cueva de los Tayos. The legends of the cave nearly all surround hidden treasures of lost ancient and giant civilizations, including the posit of an ancient yet inexplicable library room made entirely from a curious metallic formula. With caves with an intrigue, strong enough to even attract the attention of the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, one began to wonder whether these legends be true. And when you bring Father Crespi's collection into the fold, the flurry of interest surrounding these legends, and indeed the artificial nature of some of the portions of the cave itself, all become easily explainable via such motives of discovery. Father Crespi, as the title would suggest, was a religious man and one who was highly philanthropic and also incredibly interested in the artifacts of antiquity. And fortunately for him and us, the location in which he lived was steeped in lost ancient artifacts, all just waiting to be recovered. Father Crespi was a man of modest wealth and in return for curious artifacts, often found within the Taos cave, even reported to have given food in return for clear forgeries, offered by hungry individuals, although he would offer more and often money, respective of the artifact's clearly historical value. This allowed Father Crespi to gather a literal hoard of authentic ancient artifacts, many clearly from this long claim to exist metallic library his collection full of metallic plates of unknown writings and other fascinating metallic artifacts. The reason for our revisiting of these caves, and indeed the fascinating character that was Father Crespi, is our recent perusing of new information released on the cave, deliberately ignoring all aforementioned facts, including the artificial nature of some of the portions of the cave itself in particular at entrances, as if reinforced with enormous ancient lintels. Unfortunately, all that remains of Father Crespi's collection that can be confirmed as 100% his and authentic now only exist within the photos taken of him with his collection prior to his death, whereas the hoard of artifacts was ransacked and many replaced with poor quality forgeries. Thus, it is a mystery, and we believe conspiracy to conceal a lost history, which we find incredibly frustrating. 
We are frequently asked to cover the intriguing ancient documents of ancient Sumeria, and for good reason. For although the Sumerian King List is officially classified as an accurate and important chronographic document from ancient Mesopotamia, the lifespans of many of the oldest of its rulers are stated as having lived for upwards of 30,000 years. Furthermore, there is a noticeable steady decline in the duration of these rulers' lives. This gradual decline, when seen in its complete translated form, if, of course, it is indeed an accurate documentation of history, displays a clear example of devolution over many thousands of years. It lists a long succession of cities in Sumer and the surrounding regions. The first fragment of the text, which is largely believed to date back at least 4,000 years, was found in the early 1900s by Hermann Hilbrecht at the site of ancient Nippur, with its discovery subsequently published in 1906. Since Hilprick's discovery, at least 18 other fragments of the list have been found, most of them dating from the second half of the Isin dynasty. Yet this controversial claim of past rulers' ages is a reoccurring theme with many of these fragments, reiterating these incredibly long lifespans. Furthermore, intriguingly, the Epic of Gilgamesh, perhaps the most famous, still surviving contribution to world history dating back to Mesopotamia, is depicted as nothing short of a giant. Often depicted, carrying what is perceived as his pet lion, the cat, however, appears far from tame, attempting to take a chunk from his arm, but due to Gilgamesh's relative size to his furry friend, merely appears as nothing more than a kitten when in his embrace. Could these claims of a 20,000-year lifespan be connected to the additional claim of many of the figures from this era's incredible sizes? Could heavy research and a subsequent in-depth expose regarding the reality surrounding the claims of the Mesopotamian civilization finally confirm the past existence of not only giants, but human beings, whom, after their derivation from divinity, initially had lifespans stretching into 30,000 years? For as the list states, and I quote, after the kingship descended from heaven, they were situated within Eridung in Alulim. It is named after Eridung, who became king. He ruled for 28,800 years, with Alajar subsequently ruling for 36,000 years after him. Two kings who ruled for 64,800 years." End quote. As one would predict, such claims are simply dismissed by academics the world over. This is, of course, due to the tales of the king's immense longevity, and due to their own paradigms, one they are often funded to regurgitate, would have simply been impossibility. Additionally, along with this staunch denial to even consider such possibilities within mainstream study, this same fate befalls the countless, gigantic, unexplained megaliths found the world over. This is a clear example of how valuable academia perceives their illusionary, oracle-esque all-knowing regarding a complete history of human civilization. For if one was to consider such past individuals, having been responsible for the Great Pyramids for example, one could finally explain how, and indeed who, accomplished such ancient feats. But I digress. Could Mesopotamia be the key to unlocking many secrets hidden or lost within human history? We find such possibilities as highly compelling. Affectionately known as the Badlands Guardian, it is located near Medicine Hat, southeast Alberta, Canada. The feature is clearly of an uncanny likeness to that of a past Native American chief. Viewed from the air, the feature has been said by nearly all whom explore it to resemble a human head wearing a full traditional headdress with his face gazing precisely westward. Although the chosen argument for its existence is it being the result of heavy rainfall, subsequently a groundslip formation, those who use such dismissive techniques have forgotten to mention or deliberately ignore the formation's longevity and lack of morphing due to geological activity, a continual direct contradiction to these claims of geological culpability. There is a good reason we share and indeed find such curious features intriguing. We have for a long time explored many enigmatic possible ancient landmarks, 
many terrestrial, and many much further afield. Denied, dismissed on sight due to cognitive dissonance, not only due to modern paradigm, an inability to time travel back to their date of construction and photograph said undertaking. Yet most persuasive, the unthinkable, unimaginable, mind-boggling feats that, if real, many of these now-classified earthworks would have taken to achieve. There are few fields of study, in our experience, which causes such a divisive reaction and difference in opinions within antiquarian research as there is within the field of ancient, questionably possible pareidolia. We recently shared an ancient mountain known as Pedra de Gavia, and although the claim faces erosion, regardless of geological or of artificial origins, is in the most severe final stages of natural entropy, with this eventual likeness fading into a geological feature to no longer distinguishably recognizable as a possible pre-Columbian face in the near future. We cited and shared other research, the geological evidence of the face's surface seemingly cut later, being far more recently exposed to the elements. Yet, regardless, many simply dismiss the feature due to its lack of any visually distinguishable features, which, regardless of this site's possible natural origins, is a fate bestowed upon many of the truly oldest legacies of a lost world here on our planet. It must be noted that we do not claim to know these curious, often enormous landmark or stone-cut supposed monument or earthworks' true origins. But the evidence to support it as indeed a possible achievement is enormous. The Nazca Lines, Darren Kuyu, The Wonders of Egypt, the astonishing acoustic marvels of the caverns created in Malta, and so on. Not to mention the countless demonstrative feats, evidence of their capability to indeed work and eventually transport stones of mammoth proportions, molded into blocks and astonishingly ancient displays of decorative artworks found all over the world. Thus, regardless of the dismissals, we find the Badlands Guardian highly compelling.